My name is Lee Mulcahy, and the reason I'm here is because I believe that the government in Aspen has a clause in about 3,000, roughly, they control 3,000 units in their Aspen-Pitkin County Housing Authority. And they have a clause that's called APSHA's Right to Acquisition. And I call, I call this the Death Star Clause because basically it means there's no American dream. It means there's no home ownership. It means you don't own your home. It's communism. Who, but I guess the question I want to ask everybody is we're a town of 6,788. APSHA controls 3,000 units. Some units are three and four bedroom homes. A third of those 3,000 units are what's called resident occupied, where there's no cap on income or assets. But in those 1,000 units, they have this. It states, notwithstanding any provision herein to the contrary, the APSHA shall have the right in its sole discretion, discretion which means willy-nilly, to acquire any property or unit for the purpose of resale thereof. Well, this is my mom, Sandy Mulcahy. What, what does that say to you? It says they can take my home anytime they want to. And I was trying to explain to a friend. She said, I don't understand what's going on with the fact that your house is going to be taken. And I went through the logistics of it all. And she said, that, that doesn't happen in the U.S., does it? And I said, well, it certainly does. Aspen is in the U.S. She said, well, it sounds more like China or Russia. And it does. It's your home, but APSHA can take it if they choose to, which is exactly what is happening. The and, and here's the thing. The reason that we're digging in so hard is because when I went in, and, and I'd like to put this up screen on the screen, but they sent me an email October 14th, and they asked me as an artist to bring in like eight different things. Records of sales of your artwork, no problem. Records of showings in galleries or museums. Um, I'm very, very grateful that I've shown... Um, in, K in the KW Institute of Contemporary Art, which is one of Berlin's most significant museums, as well as the Nairobi National. Very grateful. It's one of East Africa's, if not its most significant museum. Uh, documentation of advertising, and I've been in galleries in Beijing and all over the world. Documentation of advertising, marketing, your works for sale. I think we all know that I've done plenty of that uh, in locally and as far as uh, online, too. Records of leasing or occupying studio space. Well, I, we live in our studio. I, we live in, in, in my gallery. Evidence of a, a profit motive. Um, certainly, I, I have uh, given, I'm ready to show that at any time. A business plan, no problem. Evidence of time and effort. Evidence of an art uh, being a source of income that you live and depend on from that profession. In addition to that, they, they sent a case uh, uh, attached it's, um, here where the IRS said that you can lose money with the expectation of making a profit. And, and APSHA says that you have to make a profit out of uh, three out of five years. So uh, the other thing, when I went in to take all this uh, in a, shortly a week after this, they refused to look at that saying, and this is what's so insulting, they said you missed the deadline. Well, the deadline was corrupted. And the, and the interesting thing on that is they had to give us a 60-day cure period. Well, they sent out the uh, notice of violation on July 17th, which meant 60 days from that is September 15th. Well, APSHA jumped the gun. They sent it out August 25th. Now, when they, at some point, maybe they realized their mistake, and they changed the guidelines, removing that 60-day cure period for the first time in seven years, by the way, in October. They always changed the rules in January. But this year, they changed it in October, right before they sued us, right? Right. So this is interesting. October 14th, you know, she sends out the email. Well, why are you... 
why are you asking me for all this if you're going to refuse to look at it a week later when I have an appointment? But October 12th, the deputy director of APSHA sends out this, and I'll, we'll put this on screen, three-page letter, right, detailing um, the changes, guideline changes right, right here. Do you think in that three-page letter that they mentioned that they removed that 60-day cure period? It's missing mm -hmm. because I mm -hmm. read it. Yeah. Wow, three pages and you can't mention one of the most significant things. If you, as a homeowner, uh, get a notice of violation that you no longer have two months to cure it. And that is the date that APSHA and everyone has used that you violated. Right. We, we can't look at it because too late. Too late. You didn't have it in on time. But it was corrupted by APSHA. Right. And, do, do, and when it was... And this is important to note because the papers are like, it's totally over, you know, too bad, so sad, uh, you lost, it's gone to the Supreme Court. Well, this was discovered by our new attorney after it went to the Colorado Supreme Court. So when you have a due process violation, that is appealable at any time. So that questions the whole, you know, order. And that's why we asked Judge Selden to vacate that order. What do you do? Nope, not going to do that. No, no. And, 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 you know, it's funny because sometimes people are, they repeat things that the city attorney might tell them, like the Mulcahy's have already had a hearing. No hearing. Uh, we had a hearing. First time in four years. Where they, the only thing they would allow us to talk about. Was the judge appointing a third party, a realtor, in other words, that would officiate the eviction. Right, the receiver. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the due process violations? Nope. No. I no. did it anyway, though. Judge Selden allowed me to. I said, I have a few complaints, and I listed them. Right. One of which is? The fact that when they filed, they filed under the wrong box that they checked. They checked this case is governed by CRCP 16.1. And the reason that's significant is that is a super expedited procedure, right? They Moving fast. Uh -huh. And it said that there can be no monetary judgment over 100000 where the house is concerned. Problem was the lot cost 150,000. Yeah, and that that paper is that's right here. We'll put this up on the screen so the audience can see it. It it says this case is governed by CRCP 16.1 because uh the first part and then the second part which is which is they broke the law. A monetary judgment over 100,000 is not sought by any party against any other single party. This amount includes attorney's fees, penalties, punitive damages. It includes, it excludes interest and cost as well as the value of any equitable relief sought. Well, we paid over 150000 Do you think Selden cares, cares about this? No. no. Insignificant. No, no, no. And, you know, he doesn't like to talk about the fact that he admitted in court that he was a member of the Lester Crown Society of Fellows when he was the assistant county attorney. Well... That's an investment because if you're for for over a decade, because if you're paying twenty five hundred dollars to be a member of the Lester Crown Society Fellows for over a decade, do you think that he is going to be lenient or show mercy on the whistleblower for Lester Crown's Aspen scheme? I don't believe so. And and you know when you when you appeal something like. You know, I'm very, very grateful that the ski codes, when they ban me for passing out a flyer, which is, you know, like a piece of paper, right? They ban me from National Forest. I'm very grateful that that, that that was declared unconstitutional. You can't ban someone from National Forest for practicing their First Amendment rights. Now, Selden banned me from riding the lifts. But, you know, I can hike up and I can ski down. I'm grateful. That's now currently in the Supreme Court, and I don't expect to win, uh, because when you fight a billionaire, you know, you, 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 need to be ex you need to expect to have all these 
suits coming from different directions. Now, I've been really grateful, uh, especially to my dad, because he hired Hal Haddon when, when they tried to ban me from the Aspen Institute. That went to the Colorado Supreme Court, and, and, and um, we were victorious. And I'm super grateful for that. But the thing is, as an artist, I can show compliance. H how come... How come only Burt Myron speaks out on this? What's the deal? I mean, a lot of people show us private support, but you know, where are the politicians? You know, now they're fearful. Anything that's done against Skiko, so to speak, parentheses the crowns. Well, it's just like when you worked for Piranesi, and you were there for quite some time and one of the crowns came in, saw you, recognized who you were, and within days you were fired. Right, you know that was the same crown, Susan Crown, that banned you from our senator's fundraiser. That's right, since yeah. we were and not that, politically correct in her eyes, and, and we that, couldn't attend. And that's the thing, you know, I have asked the crowns to forgive me. We all make mistakes. You know, should I have passed that flyer out at the Little Nell? No, no ma'am, I shouldn't have. But where I passed it out in Snowmass, that was public lands, and I should be able to do that. They interrupted me, they brought me in the office, and they banned me. Now, I'd just like to sit down with the Crowns and say, I'm sorry, let's move on, right? But what does the ban allow them to do? It allows them to pay really lousy wages. To the paper said now they're up to 4,500 employees in a town of 6,788. That's like 66% of the population. So, you know, all, we're, all I've ever said is, Mr. and Mrs. Lester Crown, be fair. I, you know, I was a member, I was a board of trustee member of the Aspen Historical Society. Did I, did I ever in my wildest dreams think that they would ban me from skiing? Of course not. I thought we'd sit down and have coffee. You know, I invited them over to my porch. Come over. Um, I think that in this polarization of our, of our country. I think the more that we can come together and drop the fences and talk to each other as community. You know, like tomorrow, we're very grateful the county commissioner's coming over, the city councilman offered to come over, um, one of the APSHA board members. I think that that is the way forward by negotiation. Because when you break the law in multiple ways, like, and you can talk about, that's another thing that Judge Selden, you know, it's like when the police investigate themselves, the, the, the Court of Appeals is not going to care that he didn't follow the law. They're just going to protect him, right? And this was dated December 3rd, which was, this was 2015. So that when you look at it, it's like, could this really have happened? because a court order went out to Judge Selden, and I assume it would also have been sent to Tom Smith, that there must be, within 42 days, a conference called a case management conference set up between Judge Selden, Tom Smith, and you. T Tom Smith being the attorney for, for APSHA, APSHA, which we should probably note that um, was investigated for dishonesty by the Colorado Supreme Court's Attorney Regulation Council. Uh, he was fired by the city of Basalt. He's a very controversial attorney, but, but he, the only time that he has ever lost regarding APSHA that I know of is when APSHA violated uh, the First Amendment rights. And that, that, you know, a lot of people talk about fake news. Well, how come the Aspen Times has refused to cover that? The, this one of the most powerful government organizations in Aspen, you right, controlling 3,000 units in a town of 6,788. The power to basically remove you from your home willy nilly, and they get caught by a judge violating our, as our Westerners, as our most sacred right, the right to free speech, our First Amendment rights, they get caught. On the record, in a 27-page ruling, has the Aspen Times, have they ever covered that story? No story. No story. But going back sorry, to what, sorry, sorry. what Judge Selden did not do, and the reason this is important is because we have spent years working on this issue. And 
it could have been mediated from the very beginning because that conference could have been held and worked through all the different issues because Lee was pro se doing his own attorney work. But that was totally ignored. The court order said the judge had to have a conference, period. Not choose to have a conference. No, had to have. Did not do it. Not important. The reason that is so significant for us, I mean, besides breaking the law, besides that, is because it would have required mediation and discussion of arbitration. That was never done. This is just a waste of money. Our money, a whole lot of money, and time and agony and wondering from day to day what was going to happen. And the offensive part to me is when you um, struggle to build your home because the city of Aspen is the one that's going to approve it. And you know what they said to me, a city of Aspen employee said, we don't want to approve this because if we let you in, we give you a certificate of occupancy, we'll never get you out. And it has been costly because my husband and I live very, I would say frugally, but in the end where he saw that, that Lee needed to complete and get a CO, he went to the bank and borrowed $200,000, and I'm going, what in the world are you doing? We've got to get that house finished. So he dies, and that leaves me dealing with a, a note at the bank to pay it off. And so has this been easy? No, it has not. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I think that I have noted before that... that um, Dad died unexpectedly, and um, you were probably not, you, you're very strong, but I don't think you were prepared for that. When I came to Houston at MD Anderson, I think you were a little bit in denial, and uh, Kara and was, I was shocked, but anyway, anyway, we're, my dad was the greatest, and, and I think about him a lot, and I love him, um, and I know he's in heaven. But he taught me, uh, you know, a, a lot of people kid me because I'm a mama's boy, but he taught me everything I know. Well, he wanted that house finished, and he knew, having dealt with the inspectors, having built three or four homes, different things that he had accomplished, that there was unfairness going on, troubled him. So he put liens on the property. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Because he knew... He protected you. ...that the city was going to swoop in at some point, or at least he had that feeling that well, they you, were not when, fair. Right. When you had the city attorney standing on the back wall, you know, doing this, it tends to have a, an effect on people, say, inspectors trying to show off for the city attorney who basically runs City Hall, Right. So I can't tell you how many electrical fixtures we ripped out that, that were, were approved and inspectors saying... Redo them. Redo and I'm, or You know what? And the frustrating thing was like they would make requirements verbally but not put them in writing, refused to. Like, and I had to do it. I did it all, and I never thought that they would still come after me after, after I got my certificate of occupancy. But I, I moved over, you know, not a big deal, but I moved over trees 12 inches in a five-foot yard. But happy to, to comply. And, and that's the crazy thing is I go in, you know, to city council and I go to the board of county commissioners and I get on my knees and I plead with them to give me 15 minutes on an agenda to talk about these due process violations, just to talk, right? To look at the travesty of justice that this whole saga has become. Do you think they'd give me 15 minutes? Because unfortunately our country is divided. It's, we're polarized. We're in, we're Tea Party Republicans and, and all the committees in Aspen and the, the Board of County Commissioners and, and the City Council, they're controlled by liberal Democrats. 
and worse, some of them are honestly, honestly communist. I, I, I say that with, you know, a wicked sense of humor and a grain of salt, but they're like socialist. And they, like George Newman, for example, he, uh, pardon me, one of the county commissioners won't even meet with us to discuss an eviction of something that he didn't even build. But we built it. Like, the crazy thing, and, and I learned so much, is like, you know, a fire sprinkler system for your home in Aspen costs more than a home in Texas. So I did all the work. I learned how to do it. It was amazing. I, you know, I'm a plumber. I can, you know, figure things out. Dad helped me. And, and we did the glass. We did the HVAC work. And it was a wonderful project. And, and, and I'm very grateful. Uh, but I don't think that in America, I never thought that after I finished a home that they would come and try to steal it because of the Death Star Clause. You don't, you can't conceptualize that. You're like, there's no way that can't happen. But it's legal. It may not be just. But, but it's legal. Yeah, and to question the unconstitutionality of that clause, well, that's just, that's going to take years. But the thing that, you know, the thing that, for me, I don't understand why they don't want to sit down and talk is because, honestly, we're, we're if the receiver comes, we're, we're not going to comply. We're not going to let them in, right? And I think that that, that is... That's a travesty that, that we're at the point where we can't, we can't talk. Now, I'm very grateful that, that the, the, the Absher people are coming over, and I hope that, that we move forward in peace and compromise. What are your thoughts? This is one of those trust God. I don't understand it. It's like living in China or Russia with people that I can't comprehend that they won't even negotiate. And the thing that's troubling is I gather they're reorganizing APSHA so that if you have a violation, rather than evicting you, which is what has happened to us, that there will be consideration, there will be fines, but it won't necessarily end in APSHA swooping in and taking your home. Yep. But it's not retroactive. So what they did in 2015 is, gee, we're sorry, but we're taking your house. Right. And the thing that, and what our attorney has said is that the constitutional, constitutionality of the taking of the house, in other words, APSHA um, does not value any of the sweat equity you put into the home, into the value of the home. We get that. That was part of the deal. We understood that. But I never, in you know, uh, f five years of building the home, thought that the hours that I that sweat equity wouldn't count towards uh, the 1,500 hour uh, requirement. So that was that was kind of a shock. You know, wait, you wait till I finish building the home to tell me this. It, well, that's not American. That's APSHA. Right, right, because they have the power. They, the Death Star Clause allows them to do that, and you know they knew that. But it's unjust to wait to wait till the house is done to then try to snatch it. I think, um, and that's why we dig our heels in, and that's why we are. Um, what, what I would ask for the community, and I thank the community for their for their love and support, and ask for your prayers. And I know so many of you are, are praying for us. And we are very grateful, and we're we're um, we're thankful for for your love and support. And this is like so many things right now. You know that it's the intersection of, of of certain currents in our society. You know where the billionaires have like complete control of the political system, and whether it's the judicial or whether it's the boards of the county commissioners. You know that influence. You know the sheriff was coming tomorrow. Well. What happened? He told you he was coming, right? Right. In fact, we planned the meeting around his timetable. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, um, I think that 
the way forward is peace. The way forward in this holiday season, and uh, I think the way forward is compromising for us just to to get this out. Um, whether it be it here at grassroots, we'll do we'll run some ads in the paper. Um, but I'm also grateful to you and Dad for showing me the way forward, because despite this corruption, you are your focus of your life is to love and serve others, and. Maybe talk about uh, your trip coming up in February. If anybody in the community wants to to volunteer to go to do uh, water harvesting efforts, um, or or donate a well in the name of a loved one or someone you're you're trying to raise money for a fourth well, talk about that. Well, we really didn't talk about the water harvesting, and that was one of those things that just came up in 2019. We met with our driller, Philip. He said, you must make those wells sustainable, and you can't just rel rely on the borehole or the water well. You need to be very creative. And he said, one of the best things you can do is to do water harvesting, which means gutters put on a roof and then tanks at the end of one right. it's part just, of it. If you're good with manual labor, you can help. Is what. And so it turned out... Yes, well, that would be a good idea. And so we went to Akshar. Akshar sold us the materials close to cost, I guess. And we were able to do water harvesting on the church where the water well was built. And so that has created for us an opportunity to include that yeah. and in that, Africa. And, yeah, and normally we stay at the Catholic Pastoral uh, Center, but Akshar has generously donated his place to house everyone. So there's no housing cost. It's just that if you want to pay for your plane over, you can help manually, you can help set up uh, uh, laptops, uh, use laptops, uh, computer labs at schools, or donate a well. Um, and uh, we'll put the Africa, www.africawaterwells.org or call us at 429-8797. Anything else, Mama Sandy? Nope, have I'm Merry, ready to go. Have a Merry Christmas.